it is 3 p.m. on the West Coast, and you have successfully logged on to the Rolo Tomasi Show. Shall we just call it the Rolo Tomasi Show? I don't know exactly what I should call it just yet. Uh, oops, hang on one second here. Let me mute that. There we go. All right, guys. Um, thanks for joining me today. Um, like I said, it's three o'clock here. Uh, I'm going to start doing these on Thursday. Uh, I got a little bit of feedback on what I should be doing uh, as far as doing a solo project. Um, and this is going to be it. So uh, I realized that I don't really need my, I'm hoping I can do this without my headphones. I got my headphones here. I might have to, it just kind of depends on, on listening to any kind of video or anything that I want to throw out there for you guys to check out. Um, I got a lot of feedback. I wanted to thank you guys all first before I get started here. Um, a lot of people want me to do a solo show. So this is the solo show. Um, let me know uh, if the audio is okay here while I Free up this. Um, a lot of guys. Let's see. There we go. Much better. All right, guys. Uh, uh, yeah, a lot of people wanted to have just me access to me. Um, I've been doing uh, a monthly AMA. Uh, Ask me anything, and I got a lot of positive feedback from that. Um, good. Thank. Thanks for the feedback, there, guys. Um, and so I just thought, what the hell? Um, I got a couple free hours on a Thursday. Let's do it. Um, this is going to be something that I'm going to do regularly. Uh, if you have questions, uh, please go ahead and throw them out here. Um, I'll, I'll try to get to, I'll try to get to the ones that, uh, aren't just, uh, super chats, uh, before I get started again. Uh, if you want to get a super chat in, that's fine. Today's topic is going to be psychology and the red pill. And, uh, give you guys a little bit of background about myself. Uh, I have been writing in the Manosphere for almost 18 years now. If you consider the, um, what is it? You consider like, like alt fast seduction, like the old school seduction forums is where I really see the red pill starting as far as intersexual uh, dynamics is concerned. So I, I started writing really in, in 2001, 2002 on a forum called So Suave. And So Suave was, it was about that time that I was in, I was going back to school for, to get my BFA. Uh, and I was minoring in behavior, well, in psychology at that time, I didn't have like a, a particular area of focus. Most of the stuff I was interested in was behavioral psychology. And I decided to double major because I was doing a lot of peer counseling uh, at the time and most of it was with older guys. Now, peer counseling when you when you're doing stuff at least when I was in in school and this was back in the early 2000s when I was um in I was just minoring in in psychology at that time. I did it because I wanted to learn people's personalities a little bit more. I was, I, I wasn't, uh, I certainly didn't have anything published. I was participating on the so suave forums as a, as a moderator at that time. And I, um, I realized that a lot of what I was reading on like a mystery method and a lot of the pickup, the early pickup artists, um, and, and really all these, uh, these, forums, the, the uh, seduction forums, alt fast seduction, I think was one. Um, the other one, well, RSD was a thing was just becoming a thing back then. Um, and, uh, and then so suave was, which is still around by, by the way, I should say, um, I was a moderator on so suave from 2008 until I couldn't keep up with it anymore. I think I stopped in 2014, somewhere around there. Anyways, the, um, the thing that made me want to double major was I was doing a lot of peer counseling as part of my um, just doing my regular core core work at that time. And I took the I took the guys that I didn't want to. Thanks for that 20 bucks there, Bull Rush. Uh, I, I took the guys I took the older guys who were looking for um looking for peer, I don't know, peer counseling. It's, that's like the best way I can say it. It's just like, you know, they're just looking for free counseling is what they were doing. And a lot of the guys I was taking on were middle-aged guys. And I realized that there was a lot of, um, a lot of guys who had a lot of problems between the ages of say like, you know, 40 and 60 years old, somewhere around there. Some guy, the oldest guy I had was like 65. And 
when you're a young guy and you are doing this kind of stuff, you don't want the old guys. I, I realized that I was sort of in a unique position because the guys that I wanted to actually wanted to talk to were the, the guys who were like between 40 and 60. And uh, so I would I would sign up for those guys, um, not the least of which because my well, later on, not the least of which because my um, my brother in law had ended up committing suicide and he was 40 years old when he did. Um, and I wanted to sort of give back or like sort of, I, I think maybe really what I was trying to do is just sort of understand why the guy would do something like that. I think probably on a gut level, I understood why. And, and I was sort of dealing with the psychological aspects of not just myself and, and dealing with the suicide, but also with, um, why the guy would do it and what were the elements that led up to it? When I talk about like Anthony Bourdain and Asia Argento, I, I hate to, to joke around about that, but, um, you know, it's really a serious thing. So people say, well, Asia Argento, she didn't force him to commit suicide. It's just, yeah, that's where his head was at. Oh yeah. See, that's what I want to understand. That's where I, that's really what kind of got me involved in all this. It was, it wasn't, I mean, yeah, I mean, I was interested in, uh, the, the seduction aspect of things. I'm not going to lie. I like I like understanding the you know why men and women are are the way they are. And of course, the, the work that I was doing at the time, I was out in the field quite a bit. I wasn't like picking up chicks, but I could see other guys picking up chicks, and I could see the the <clears throat> at you know if I was at a promo or if I was at you know if I was out in the field, so to speak. I was it was interesting because I was sort of a, a student of human behavior. And that's what got me into behaviorism and, and learning behaviorism. Behaviorism was really something that appealed to me very early on because I think like a lot of other people, I had a really bad taste in my mouth when it came to psychology. Um, and uh, my uh, my stepmother back when I was a teenager was big on going and seeing psychologists and therapists. And I just never, I could never really get behind it. You know, she would say, you know, when we were trying to blend our families back in the day, you know, back in the 80s, um, it was always we had to go to a therapist. We all got we got to sit down and to go to family therapy to make everything work out. And it's just like, it was just people just bullshitting each other and, and coming, it was basically an occasion for everybody to just sort of let out their, the, the bullshit that they were thinking about. And I think a lot of people, when they think of psychologists, they think of psychotherapy, they think of like, sit down on the couch and talk about your feelings. Um, that is one particular aspect of psychology. It's not, uh, people think about it, you know, <laughs> do, you, do you guys remember? I don't know if anybody has seen that movie, uh, Old School. Do you remember when the the family therapist when they were, you were in the trust nest and that that whole scene? I thought that was kind of funny. I think that's kind of along the same lines as what people really think of when it comes to psychology. There's a lot more to psychology than just the cognitive humanist uh, approach. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, Carl Jung today. I'm going to talk about uh, Maslow. I'm going to talk about uh, some other, some of the other guys that I think that we sort of fixate on when we think about psychology. I, I wanted to, I, I don't think I've ever done this um, as far as in, in any interview because people don't, people always want to, you know, talk to me about the books. They want to talk to me about the red pill. They want to talk to me about what's going on in the manosphere. And they really, I, I don't have an opportunity, I think, to sort of get into the core elements of why the red pill and for lack of a better term the red pill in the manosphere why they are actually rooted in psycho firmly rooted in psychology and people have a hard time with that because they think psychology they, uh, they don't like psychologists um i've been on pat campbell's show a number of times where i have talked about um I've talked about family therapy and how it's, or, or, or marriage counseling. When I talk about marriage counseling, another thing that people get a bad taste in their mouth, they think of psychology in terms of therapists um, rather than, um, like we can talk about behavioral psychology. That's one of the reasons I like behavioral psychology is because it's nuts and bolts. And it starts from a, a, a very simple premise, which is that you cannot determine motive or intent by any other means than behavior. And that is also a root tenet, I think, in the red pill, where we say, don't believe what she says, believe what she does. That's where I went with, that's where I started with that. 
Um, hang on real quickly here. I got a couple of supers. Which books had the biggest impact on me? On me? Um, um, I'll get to that. I, I will get to that. Hang on. Thanks, Pedro, for that one. Um, did you, you did a show with Pat, I'm sorry, this is Mysterium. You did a show with Pat and began to tell your brother-in-law story. I, you didn't finish because of time constraints. Can you show where, can you show where you tell the full story? Um, I'll, uh, you know what, I'll, I'll give you a, a quick breakdown if you guys really want to know that. I've talked about this on a, on a few occasions. Um, my brother-in-law, not my actual brother, but my brother-in-law, who is, you have to understand who he is, okay? My brother-in-law, when I say my brother-in-law, it is the guy who married my wife's sister. So if my sis, if she is my sister-in-law, then he is my brother-in-law. Um, here's the real quick, <clears throat> real quick breakdown of that story is uh, right around 2003, I think it was March of 2003, my, uh, my brother-in-law ended up hanging himself. And he did so after uh, no, nobody really expected it. OK, I just, just want to say that there was no like outward signs. Um, most guys, when I'd done a little bit of studying afterwards as part of my part of my right research, but my my work when I was in school, um, men tend to be more successful at suicide. Uh, women tend to attempt it more, but they don't go through with suicide, which I think from our intersexual dynamics perspective, um, there's a, a real difference between how men and women approach suicide. If a man's going to kill himself, he's going to find a way to do it. Um, I, gosh, I, I, I'll, I'll talk about it. I, I'll, I'll talk about my, my brother-in-law first, and then there's something else I want to talk about as well. Um, so my brother-in-law was 40 years old, and he, uh, he'd been married to my sister-in-law, uh, since they were like 19 or 20. He ended up knocking her up when they were in their late teens, I think 18 or 19 years old. And everybody thought he was going to uh, he was gonna flake. Uh, this is back in like the late 70s, early 80s, somewhere around. They, everybody thought he's just, he's just a kid. He's just going to leave. He's not going to do the right thing and marry her. And, and they were really getting ready to, <clears throat> to help, to have a life without a father involved. But he did he did what nobody expected of him. He decided that he was going to, you know, put us, put his life plans on hold, didn't go to the military, didn't go to college and decided to do the right thing and get a job and support and marry, marry her and support the kid. And that's what he did. And as a result, he also had a second child, <clears throat> excuse me, later on in his twenties. So there's two children that were produced in that marriage and they were married for about, 20 years. So if they got, if they got married about 20 years old and they ended up getting a divorce or they were fine. She had filed, she had filed for divorce um, right around 2003. And it was at that time uh, that he started experiencing and dealing with depression. We didn't know it at the time, but he was, he wasn't giving any outward signals. He wasn't like walking around, oh, I'm depressed all the time. Um, he, they even had gone to quote unquote marriage counseling at that time, at that point. And what had happened is she decided that, uh, you know, the kids were just about out of the house. They were going to be empty nesters very soon. And, he, uh, she decided that she wanted to go get with, uh, a millionaire. I mean, literally a guy who was, they, I'm not going to give you the, the breakdown of what exactly they did, but she, let's just say it was in tourism. Okay. And she had come into contact with a guy who was a multi-million dollar guy and decided that she was going to trade up. She was going to trade up. This is after this guy had pretty much built his life around his one. He had, he had a hardcore one-itis for her. Um, meaning like he would, and he would literally say, I can't live without her. I, I don't know what I would do without her. And the guy had gone from like rags to riches kind of thing. He, he'd made a, a good chunk of change, not a, certainly not in the millions, but he was very industrious, I think is the best way I can put it. And he had built a, a home. He was actually working and building on, they bought some property and he was building a home at that time. And it was right around then that she decided that she wanted to get a divorce because she saw a, a bigger fish. And, um, yeah, if you, if you think that this is a little weird when we meet up for a thing, you know, we, we're not very tight with that side of the family, just so in case anybody wants, was wondering about that. Um, however, uh, he ended up hanging himself when nobody thought he was going to do something. That was basically about two, two weeks before the divorce was going to go through. And he literally believed in his head that he could not live without her. And so he took his own life. 
And so that's the that's the sort of story. Like that's the the background. I think the real story is what happened afterwards, and all of the rationales that all the women in the family decided to make up uh, about why you know, nobody wanted to accept the fact that my sister-in-law's actions were the catalyst for him killing himself. Now, ultimately, he was responsible for his own death. Okay, anybody who is committing suicide, that nobody is killing a guy who has is committed suicide. Asia Argento did not kill Anthony Bourdain, but her actions predicated or set in motion his suicide. That was his sort of what we call a catalyst. Like that's what sparked him to want to go and kill himself. The the fact that my sister-in-law was going to um uh, distance herself and and basically break uh, detonate the family is what what Dalrock would call it um, uh, because she had a bigger and better deal a bigger fish had rolled in and and you know let's I don't want to go into the de the personal details of all that but let's just say that her her actions were the catalyst for his suicide and what is interesting to me is that this side of the family is very very religious and so everybody decided that they wanted to. Uh, find some sort of cutesy way of rationalizing why he was going to do it himself. Even his kids were saying like, uh, um, like he just had something wrong with them. Or there was something wrong with that side of the family, or he was prone to that kind of stuff, or he had deeper issues, or it was a psychological issue. And and anything impo anything possible to to sort of lead away from the idea that my sister-in-law's actions had done that. Now, here's the other thing that got me, and this has sort of set me on this path, is wanting to understand this and help guys out, you know, to, because essentially the guy had really bad one-itis. He would literally say she was his soulmate. And if, I, if I'm if i honest, um, she was easily one to two steps above him in sexual market value. He just knocked her up. And she's still to this very, to this day, she's in her 50s and she's still a very good looking woman. Um, not as good looking as when she was 25, but let's, I mean, relatively speaking, she's, she's in good shape. So, um, that, that set in motion, like I said, a lot of stuff that came afterwards. Um, I, I can remember talking or trying to explain this to other women who didn't, you know, like my, my sister-in-law decided like right after she was married to the new guy within like just maybe about a year after the suicide. And I thought that, that was really callous, but she was already going to do that. And people who didn't even know her, women who didn't even know her, you want to talk about the sisterhood Uberalis? Here's a here's a really good example of that. Women who didn't even know her were defending her actions, were were defending her from saying, "Well, you know, she got a better." You know, if if it has to do with hypergamy, the sisterhood will always defend any actions that promote or um, that uh, in I say enforce, but reaffirm hypergamy. So if a woman is divorcing her husband, uh, she will have a, even, even anonymously, she will have a network of women who will back her up, even if they don't know who she is. And that's what I was, I was finding was really odd in all this because I remember I'm, I'm fairly red pill at that time, but I'm, I wasn't writing. I didn't have a blog back then. It was 2003. Um, but I was relatively red pill when I, we didn't call it that, but I was writing on SoSwap at the time and I was just sort of working this stuff out. And it was the stuff that came afterwards. It was, like I said, the, the societal rationales, the personal rationales for why the guy um, really, he, oh, really, he's not in hell. He's, uh, you know, he's in heaven right now. They, those kinds of things, like trying to find some way to, to, to make people feel better about the fact that the guy had pretty much killed himself as a result of believing that. He couldn't live without her anymore. So that's the that's the basic, um, the basic story right there. I got another one here. Mike says, "Is the feedback women giving you during the honeymoon phase worthless? Blue pill tendencies seem to be seen as positive at first, especially when she chased you, but a turn off later. Keep up the good work. Thank you, Mike. Um, the feedback women give you during the honeymoon phase worthless. Uh, you know, I, I I get what you're saying. It's like, is it sweet sunshine? Is, or do women blow sunshine up your ass when when it's you're in the honeymoon phase? And I think probably so. Um, more, I think one of the things is like when women are are um, prompted to give you compliments, as I mean, like you give a guy compliments. Um, I think that that is more for themselves than it is for the actual guy. 
And I'm not saying that because I think, you know, well, women are mean or horrible. No, I, say I think that they do that sort of as a, as a, I mean, a coping mechanism, but as a, um, a way of reaffirming to their own psyches that they're with a guy that is, uh, that meets their hypergamous standards or whatever. So, um, you know, the, the compliments might be, might, might be, you know, hard and fast in the very beginning. And then later on, they just, they just sort of back up off of them as they get to know you or as you sort of get into regularity or familiarity. Familiarity breeds contempt, right? Uh, so, uh, yeah, I, I, I don't know. I put it this way uh, in the honeymoon phase, and this will actually help your game in the honeymoon phase. If you, ju if you're just getting with a girl, you got a new plate or whatever, and you're having sex with her for, for there's that lust, right? There's like, man, I can't wait to get off of work so I can go get her in the sack, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, <clears throat> that's healthy just so you guys know i think that that's i think that that's healthy I, there I, I think that lust is very underrated um, and a lot of people say well there's a difference between lust and like you know infatuation it, you're still feeling the same things you you can't wait to tear each other's clothes off what is being said during that time is really more self-affirming than anything else so that's just a uh you know, just something to keep in mind. Anyways, getting back to today's topic. Today's topic is the connection between the red pill and psychology. And I don't think that it is any surprise to anyone that the red pill, at least from my perspective, in interse understanding intersexual dynamics requires a certain uh, <clears throat> understanding or certain acceptance of evolutionary psychology. Um, even if you don't, even if you don't like the, if even if you don't like the idea of psychology, a lot of people don't because a lot of it's very liberal and hippy dippy and very humanist. That's a lot of people's under. I was getting back to what I was saying is that a lot of people's understanding of psychology comes from that humanist uh, psychotherapy kind of stuff. Very Jungian, very Freudian actually. Freud is where, where psychotherapy actually began with Freud, but um, we think of things in terms of. You know, sit on the sit on the couch and talk about your feelings, uh, or you know, the therapy kind of thing where you're sitting and you've know, got patchouli, you know, or incense burning in the, in the background or something. This is all very '70s, hippy dippy, you know, boomer. Well, it's not boomer psychology. That's excuse me, that's what it is. Um, but that's not all that psychology is. And when I got into studying psychology, I was much more drawn to behavioral psychology because I could see it in action. And when I was learning uh, concepts like um, concepts like uh, operant conditioning or beha like behavioral conditioning, when I talk about the blue pill, I always say blue pill conditioning because I think that from a behavioral standpoint, young boys, well, you're what, actually pretty much raising a child in, in any sense is conditioning that child. If you're saying I'm going to instill my values into that child, well, you're conditioning that child to... Um, to think like you, to believe in the same things you do, to have some sort of, you know, to instill values. I think that's kind of interesting right now because a lot of that is flying out the window right now. It's okay to instill certain values. It's okay to, to tell a little three-year-old boy, uh, oh, do you feel like a girl, Johnny? That's okay. You can dress up like a girl. and you can, so That's instilling an idea. That's conditioning that child to believe something that you believe it's not based on anything concrete it's based on your belief set so when you learn a religion or you learn certain what we call family values those kinds of things those are behavioral conditionings that start from a very um from a very young age so when i talk about blue pill conditioning or i talk about the village what i mean is it's a psychological conditioning that you are subjected to from a from you know, I, I usually mark it at about five years old because they say that that's like between five and six years old is when ch children are like sponges and they sort of just adopt whatever is you know thrown their way. So if you want to really condition the alpha out of a child, that's when you do it is from five o'clock or five, five o'clock, five, five years old until they're about like puberty, puberty, right? So if you from five to about 14 years old, that's when a majority of psychological blue pill psychological conditioning happens now that is behavioral psychology it's to get inside your head right to make you think that you are a um, you you actually came to these ideas on your own when in, in fact it's the village that's disney the village pop culture your parents your religion that kind of stuff has put that stuff into your head and that's why i always refer to the blue pill as conditioning because it really is social engineering or it's psychological conditioning that we have been doing 
for a very, very long time. Uh, we've been, things have changed though. I mean, we've done this from the time we were hunt, in hunter gatherer tribes, right? We, te we learn through, uh, children learn through play. They also learn through, uh, watching their, watching adults do things. And as a result, they come to, uh, either live better lives or give them a set of things to, um, uh, set of, I don't say values, but a set of behaviors to follow that build into something more, maybe like psychological schema. Okay. So what happens then is we've been doing this for, for a very long time, but what's changed? So why are we, why are we teaching children? Why are we psychologically conditioning boys to, as if they are, um, defective girls? Why have we been doing that? Well, a change, a fundamental shift happened right around this, this 1965, 1968, somewhere around there, um, when we had the sexual revolution. And that was when uh, we introduced hormonal birth control. We gave, uh, thanks Billy for that 10 bucks. Uh, we, uh, we decided, I don't know, I don't think it was a collective decision. People will say, well, it's, it's cultural Marxism, whatever. Okay, let, let's just put that aside for right now. All that, all that good socialism, cultural Marxism stuff doesn't work unless men are men and women are women. So what happened? How did we, how do we get from instilling certain like old, old social contract beliefs in our children? And how do we get to where we're at right now? Well, it's been this process and some will say it's a concerted process since the sexual revolution to masculinize women and to feminize men. Well, how do you do that? Well, you got to start very young. You start very, very early. Um, that's why I think that we're teaching, we're trying to instill these ideas about or condition these ideas about gender into the, the upcoming generations. So that's why there's this social push to convince the larger society that um, that a, a little child of three years old has the cognitive capacity to choose its own gender um, or to know enough about sex and to know enough about people and humanity and the world to teach to, to teach them that they can be a boy or a girl if they want to. I think it's really kind of twisted because it, it, uh, it's like almost like a self-contradictory um, belief set because if gender is a social construct then why do we need to take physical actions to change that that child's gender why do we have to do it at three years old why is there such a push for that well because we want to make sure that the next generation is, the next generation of boys is more feminine than the than the one prior to it um, so that's where a lot of this starts and it's a lot of you know, how do you get inside someone's head how do you condition beliefs for a lifetime that's how you do it you start very very young um, so when you see little boys dressing up in drag uh, at 12 and then at nine years old and we go, oh, that's great. Good, Johnny. Good, good for you, uh, Desmond. You're, you're great. We love you. Uh, we, we praise that, but we, we demonize, you know, we, we will praise a little boy dressing in drag. But like when you see like these, these little girls who are doing these dance competitions who couldn't be more than like seven or eight years old and they're dancing like strippers, we say, oh, that's terrible. That's sexualizing young little girls. Okay, fine. But we don't say that about boys. Why? Well, because we want to psychologically condition boys to be more feminine. There is a, um, a couple of things I, I gosh, I, I really, I, I've got a list of things. I'm, I'm a note taker just in case anybody doesn't know. Now you get to, you get to know a little bit more about Rolo today. Um, I'm a note taker. If you've ever seen me in any of my live interviews and stuff, I've always got a notebook. I'm always, always doing stuff. So I got a list of things right here that I wanted to get to. I'm probably not going to get to damn near any of them, I'm sure. Um, <clears throat> But I wanted to break down a few things before I get into Jung, because a lot of people wanted wanted to ask me questions. Why do you hate Jung so much? Well, I'll get to that today, promise. Um, when I look in psych, when I look at psychology, I look at things from a behavioral standpoint. I don't look at things from a cognitive humanist. You know, let's all talk about it. A lot of that stuff is all about based on self-reporting. And a lot of times we will, we will relate to ourselves or we want to put ourselves in the best light. So we will say things or we will, we will like, when we talk we ask, uh, if you ask a woman, for instance, you say, ask a woman, how many, how many sexual partners have you had? Women tend to, um, to underestimate that men tend to overestimate that. Why? Well, first of all, they, you know, look at the, look at the reasons, right? You want a man wants has, has a different sexual strategy than a woman does. Um, however, what, what is it about that whole you know, asking those questions. Well, you're putting that person on the spot and they're going to give you those particular answers because 
they have well first of all they got their own biases but they they are self-reporting and self-reporting is one of the most unreliable i mean see, sometimes in some cases it's the only means possible to you know get statistics and all that but is the most unreliable way of judging or of estimating the value of a particular psychological dynamic that's one of the reasons why i like behaviorism because you you see what's going on you can condition behavior you can model you can mold behavior um, you can do a lot with behaviorism. And uh, so that's where a lot of my, uh, if you read the first book, that's where a lot of my ideas come from. I, I look at things in terms of behavioral psychology before anything else. I would have probably got into evolutionary psychology back then, but it wasn't as big a deal as it is now. It wasn't as evolved a science at that point. Uh, Tim Allen, the Tim Allen. Uh, got to the point where I don't want my ex back, but I fear I'll never be able to love or give the same love to another woman like I did with my ex. <gasps> oh, I was I was like she was brought out of creative side in me. I feel I lost and I will never get back. Yeah, here's here's the thing, Tim. Listen to me. You're thinking like a chick right now. Okay, you're thinking like a woman. You're thinking in terms of like this romantic comedy crap, okay? I'm not coming to, I'm not, I'm, this is the tough love side of things. And since you gave me like a $20 super chat, I feel like I need to, to address this. You've come on this show, you've, 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 you've commented not on just this show, but on like pretty much every rule zero. If you want some sort of counseling, please go ahead and, and get my, here's my, my, my email address is rtrationalmail at gmail.com hit me up i'll be happy to talk to you about all this stuff the reason you feel the need to do this is because you are looking for affirmation from other people to sort of pat you on the back nobody's going to pat you on the back here i'm going to give you tough love because i don't i don't get paid for that i mean thank you for the 20 bucks but i don't get paid to do this okay so i'm going to tell you what i think you need to hear instead of what you think what you know you think you're going to get okay stop thinking like a chick all right that's what you're doing that's that's the, the you want to talk about okay we're just talking about female conditioning like we're talking about how how men are are from a very early age are taught to to think and to perform and to behave like defective girls this is the defective girl coming out in you don't like you're done with this chick okay be done with it you're done okay i understand you're going to have to go through the detox phase i get it but you're done okay that's it accept that move on the best thing dude and it's, i know it's easy for me to say it's easy for anybody to say oh just go and move on dude it's hard to do but i, th I think when we we self-analyze we don't self-analyze from a perspective of why am i thinking like this like you're feeling i'm feeling all of this stuff like i, I can't you know can't choose the only one that brings out my creative side i'll never be able to love again how many dudes have said that how many you know like it's fucking this shakespearean death quotes or something like that ask yourself this like pull like think of yourself in the third person pull yourself away from from like make you make make think think of it i don't want to like condition you to like think be a schizophrenic but i'm just saying pull yourself out and think of yourself in the third person right now why are you thinking the way you are why do you feel those way that way it's not because she was some magical unicorn that's because you were conditioned to respond to this situation like that just like i was saying about my my uh my brother-in-law the reason why he killed himself is because he literally couldn't live without her why why can't you live without her because you have this shakespearean sense of you know loss so but why is that so start looking at things from a third third person okay back up out of it and then look at that guy now who are you going to be are you going to be in your rational mind or are you going to be in your irrational emotional mind that's going to i'm kind of glad you got to that because i want to get to uh to instinct emotion and reason today so we will get to that here in just a second um I got another one, Billy and Philly. Billy and Philly. No, Chris B and Philly, sorry. Uh, Rolo, many young men are wearing pink clothes today. Is this feminization? Yes, it is feminization because it is this idea that um, anything, you, you ever notice this, is that anything that um, that goes against the social well, the social justice, this, the feminist imperative, the female imperative, the feminine imperative, anything that goes against the feminine imperative is always an attack on your 
masculinity. It's like, oh, I guess you're not secure enough in your masculinity to wear pink. I had a, I had a story about that one time. I, uh, I, I was I was working for a company at one point, and we were supposed to go on like one of these. I think it was in October, and it was like Breast Cancer Awareness Month, and we're all supposed to wear pink for some sort of like like three k thing we're doing. I don't know. We were doing some some walk, and I didn't wear pink. I'm 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 not gonna wear pink just because of that. You know, hey, if that's what you want to do, go ahead. And of course, what's the first thing anybody says? Oh well, I guess you're not. I guess you're not man enough to wear pink. Ha <laughs> ha. No, I'm secure enough in my masculinity not to follow along with your bullshit. I'm secure enough in my masculinity to know that pink is a feminine color and I'm not feminine. And I'm not going to be feminine just because you told me to be feminine. So I'm secure enough in my masculinity not to follow along with your, you know, the, with the herd. I can talk about it in those terms, but you ever understand, you ever realize that when whenever you're talking about something when you're talking about like gender issues if you say something that is counter to that narrative they always say i guess you're not secure in your masculinity oh we're going to talk about poly right or we're going to talk about cuckoldry or we're going to talk about um wanting to know like a dna <laughs> i've heard this before a dna like guys going and getting dna tests well i guess you're not secure enough in your masculinity to believe what your mom said or believe what be, believe what the mother said believe what your wife said that is actually your child and it, uh, no i'm doing this because my rational mind is saying i have some doubts and i want to figure out what's going on here but notice that the attack is always on masculinity it's always on i guess you are not man enough to accept all this bullshit manipulative bullshit and i think that Guys need to, again, pull yourself away from it and look at things for, as in like a third person in the third person. Uh, let's see what else we have. Super, super nifty. Susie says, hi, roll. I'm 29 year old woman currently dating a 40, a 48 year old divorced man. Okay. Hmm. Okay. He is successful business owner. I noticed that he only asks me out on Sundays. Does this mean that he isn't really interested? Uh, I don't know. Did, I, I would have to, I got a lot of questions. You know, people give me like these specific scenarios. My, my, I run through a list of questions automatically. First of all, you're 29 years old. So one, you're a textbook example of, uh, the epiphany phase right now. Why is a 48 year old dude attracted to you at, tw at 29? Uh, you're entering into epiphany phase right now. And, uh, yeah, he, he looks like a good prospect. So if you know anything about, if you've read my book and you understand the epiphany phase, you'll understand why I'm making an issue of this right now. <clears throat> um, is he not really interested? Well, maybe he sees you as a plate. You know, what, what do you mean? Inter what's, what's the ultimate goal? Do you want to marry this guy? Do you want to have something beyond just, you know, fooling around with him on a Sunday? Maybe he has other plates and those other plates are, are, you're relegated to Sunday because the other plates get Saturday. Um, I don't know what's what's his schedule like. Yeah, you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of questions. Is he really interested? Uh, I don't know. There's there's other questions I would ask. So let's see. Yeah, I know. I I'm so, yeah, Tool Riff says you got to go on Joe Rogan show. I would love to. Um, I know Hotep Jesus dropped my name with Joe, so I'm fairly certain that he or some of his people know about me or know of me. Um, I, I think I might be a little too hot for Joe Rogan. And I don't mean that like I'm not glossing myself. I mean, hot in the sense that like the stuff that I would talk about would probably rub him the wrong way, particularly when I talk about um, open cuckoldry. I know, I know for a fact that Joe, um, I love you, Joe, if you're watching, <laughs> uh, I know for a fact that he married a single mother and he is sort of the step parent thing. And I think that me saying me, me convincing anybody that, you know, that step parenting today is a soft form of cuckoldry would probably rub him the wrong way. Um, and I don't want to get in a fight with Joe Rogan. I think he's probably a little more muscular than I am. <laughs> uh, Mysterium again, G Rolo. I wish I would have, had you in my life 10 years ago. That's why I wrote preventive medicine. Uh, thanks for keeping it real. Best of luck, Tim out to Tim Allen. Yeah, Tim, also go read Detox. Go onto my site, go onto the Rational Mail, go into the go into the search box and type in Detox. That's what you're going through right now. All right. So anyways, getting back to what, getting back to my main points here. 
I'm going to talk to you about a couple of things. I think evolutionary psychology is is and should be the basis for inter, for understanding intersexual dynamics. Whenever you add the word, and I, I, I'm going to give away part of my fourth book here, but whenever you add the word evolution to anything, people turn off. They're like, uh-uh. I don't believe in evolution. Screw that. No, no, no. Um, creationism or whatever. I don't know. Whatever the, the latest going thing is. That doesn't mean necessarily that I'm anti-religious or I don't have some sort of faith because I accept evolution as, a ba as the basis. It's the best working model. Let's put it that way. Okay. Even if you don't believe in evolution, I still think that it is at least the best. And, and if the jury's still out, I still think it's the best working model to go with right now. And there's a really great book. I should probably put the link in it in the description here. But there's a really great book called um, Finding Darwin's God. And I think it's Kenneth Miller is the guy who was the author of it. Um, I love that book. That was actually the last book my dad ever gave to me before he kind of lost his mind. And my dad died from dementia, like well, complications from dementia. And, um, but before he, while he was still lucid, he, uh, he suggested that book to me. And I thought it was really interesting because it sort of, I think, balances religion, like a faith-based understanding of life with evolution. I don't think, I don't think they're mutually exclusive. Let's just say that. So, but when you add evolution to anything, particularly psychology, which a lot of people already think is sort of hippy dippy, you know, humanist kind of stuff to begin with. Um, I think anybody who has a problem with with evolutionary psychology as the basis for red pill thought really needs to go look at the work of Gads, Gadsad and um, Marty Hazelton and uh, I think who else David Buss is, would be another one. A lot of these guys don't like me because I connect dots that they don't want to connect or they can't connect um, as, as psychologists or as, as uh, tenured <laughs> tenured you know professors in academia um they can't say some of the stuff that i would i would necessarily connect and they don't even want to have those discussions because they could lose their tenure by doing that unfortunately that's the world we live in today um you know if nothing else you'll get your um you'll get your your, your talk or your speech or whatever censored by by the uh by the school if not the students themselves so that unfortunately that's where we're at today uh, I, I connect a lot of dots with respect to evolutionary psychology that I don't think that people necessarily like. However, um, if you are of the opinion that evolutionary psychology is just sort of backwards engineering things, I would urge you to go look at um, the work of Gad Saad. Uh, evolutionary psychology is one of the most strictly defined psychologies there are i think maybe next to probably beha behavioral psychology is definitely it's nuts and bolts you see it happening in real time that's the great thing about behavioral psychology either it worked or it didn't because the criteria for the basis of proof the basis of evidence is right there in front of your in front of your face psych evolutionary psychology is it asks a lot of questions it does make presumptions but it's not just so reasoning and I, again, I would I, I put in the description here, I wrote a I've got a, a piece that I wrote a while back called um, In Defense of Evolutionary Psychology. Have a look at that. I'm not going to get I'm not going to dig too deep into it, but I think that understanding or even just asking the questions that evolutionary psychology does is very important. And as soon as somebody starts drifting away, when, when I see people and I'm, I don't want I'm not going to pick on Roosh today, but when I see Roosh like back in 2015, sort of leaving the idea of you know hard evolution for a more faith-based approach that's when i'm that's when i part ways man because i need to see the nuts and bolts i mean i'm the kind of guy that always likes to look under the hood i think i've mentioned this many times before is it's not enough for me to know that the car just starts when i put the key in the ignition i want to know how to tear the part tear the car apart and put it all back together again and there's only one empirical way to do that. I'm an empiricist at heart. Okay. That's not to say I don't have a faith. I do, but um, I think that piecing all this together and understanding the mechanics of things is, is we owe it to ourselves. It's a, an obligation to truth. So that's my, there's my moralist speech for the day. I'm going to go and check these other ones out here. Thank you guys for behaving yourself in the, um, the chat today. I don't have Sam in there. I think I might have conk. 
let's see guys uh what age group should i target as a 29 year old oh this is Susie again um uh, well hold on Susie. let me get to let me let me get back to you here in a second do you know of dante nero i do know of dante nero i actually follow him on twitter um i wouldn't mind interviewing him i think he's a kind of an interesting dude a lot of the stuff we talk about is pretty much the same you know we one thing about being in the red pill as long as i have been in the red pill is that a lot of a lot of a lot of new guys who seem like they're old guys um we're all we're all on the same page or we're all at least see the same dynamics we might have different names and terminology for things but we all all see different dynamics um so uh, let me get back to Susie. you're new uh, okay Susie, but just because you've been so kind and you've given you've given so much Susie. um <clears throat> you're 29 years old the epiphany phase for women starts between 29 and 31 years old sometimes it's a little bit before that it could be a little before that uh michael thanks for that 20 bucks brother uh say thank you for the information really you improved my life god bless thank you um so Susie, let me tell, tell you something you're 29 years old you're are just entering into the epiphany phase um if you are child free you're in a better position than you would be if you were a single mother i don't know whether you are or you aren't between 29 and 31 years old is what i call the epiphany phase and this is the phase at which women tend to acknowledge that they can no longer compete in the sexual marketplace in the to the same degree that they used to be able to so at 31 years old you are less you are less of a competitor than you were when you were 31 or excuse me, 21 years old so i'll say okay so you're 32 years old and you're less of a competitor than you were at, you you couldn't compete against your 22 year old self you want to get most women want to get back to that state of you that's why they call it forever 21 not forever 41 so um there is this i think this subconscious acknowledgement among women at that phase where they say okay i'm gonna have to find a guy to settle down with either he's gonna have to be the he's gonna have to be the hot chad or the hot alpha guy i want to say chad, the, the hot alpha guy that i i can lock down and sort of turn him into a good father or hopefully he's ready to go do that i'd really love to do that but if that's not possible then i want to get with a, a a dutiful, well-off beta who I think might be able, I might be able to turn into an alpha. And so a lot of, a lot of that inner turmoil happens right around 29 years old. It's when your id wants to still have fun with a hot guy in the foam cannon party in spring break, like when you were 22 years old, but yet that guy's not really a marriage material. He might be fun to have sex with, but he's not the kind of guy who's dependable enough and, and in, in control of and, you know, his, his life's not arranged well enough for you to think of a future with this guy. So that's what prompts the epiphany phase. And that's when women say, well, you know what? I'm a bit older now and I'm in my sexual prime. No, you're not. You're not your, your sexual prime was way back it was, was way back in when you were 22 23 years old but you want to think so and you want to say well i've got a lot to offer i've learned a lot i'm done with the jerks i'm done with the bad boys i'm done with the commitment phobic boys i want to find another where are all the nice guys when you're right around that epiphany phase like 31 30 31 years old that's when you have that 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 that, that conversation with yourself like i really want to have sex with a fun alpha dude but they'll never commit uh, but i really i really like the the we, we got to get with this nice you know settle for settle for the that's why i call it settling down i really want to settle for this wonderful you know blue pill beta guy who's a coder and he's got his shit together and he would make a good dad but he's just not as exciting as the guys that i knew back in college well that's the your that's your ego and that your ego is having a conversation with your id your id wants to go is the hedonist right your your id wants to go wants what it wants it wants to have sex it wants to have fun it wants to have excitement right well the ego says no we gotta have some guy who's gonna be a good prospect for the future and so there's this this inner turmoil where you sort of decide that you want to be um who you want to be going forward some women don't even do that some women will go through an epiphany phase and they decide you know what that's okay i'm still good looking i, I can i can freeze my eggs and i can get i can get uh, mr right when i'm 40 years old and, and i can do artificial insemination if worse comes to worse um <clears throat> but um most women 
decide that that's when they want to get right with God. Oh God, I got this great beta. I got to make him jump through, through some hoops. I got to make sure that he doesn't think I'm easy. All right. She, this is when women go, well, you know, unconditionally have sex with a guy like an alpha guy in the foam cannon party in Cancun on spring break when they're 23 years old, that guy didn't have to jump through any hoops. He didn't have to, he didn't have to, you know, spoon you on the, on the couch to make you feel comfortable to have sex. You got, you just saw him. It was on. And that was fun. You were DTF. Right. And it was on. Now you're kind of like 29 years old. And you go, well, you know, I got to, if, if anything, I got to make sure he's the right guy. Right. I got to make sure that he wants the job. Right. So you're going to make him wait. Um, a good example of this. And I, I've used this story a million times. My poor girl, and I work in the, in the liquor industry, my, my girls who do like that, my pouring promotions and stuff like that, they all, I've heard this on multiple occasions. One will say, and this is my infamous story about the poor girl. Um, one will say to the other, have you ever had sex on the first night? And the other one will say, well, yes, but not if he was boyfriend material. <laughs> so essentially if the guy's hot enough and he's fun, look, looks like a good time. Women will go and not make that have zero rules for that guy, but they have all kinds of rules for the guy who is the boyfriend material guy. And there is no cognitive dissonance whatsoever when it comes to stuff like that. That's the, that's sort of the epiphany phase conversation that women have. And so that's when they want to convince themselves that they're going to get right with God, or they're going to live a different way, or I'm going to do it right this time. And I'm going to make the beta jump through these hoops. No, no, you're just, people say, well, isn't, isn't that, isn't she being sincere? Yeah. She sincerely believes that she sincerely believes that, that she's doing the right thing, but it's bloody convenient to be doing it right then and there. Why is that? Well, let's look. Why are, well, she's 29 to 31 years old. Her prospects are drying up. She can't compete the same. She's hit the wall. She hasn't hit the wall here. She's hit the wall here. So who should you be going after? I think that the, 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 the real answer to that question is a guy who is five to seven years older than you. That's the guy you should be going for understand yourself, understand you're going through that and understand that um, you are less able to compete. So if you want to change your game, here's, here's some real good advice. I'm going to, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk to the lady. I'm going to talk to the ladies today. Uh, here's some real good advice. Um, understand yourself, understand that you're going through that. Uh, own it, at least own it. Most women won't even own the epiphany phase. No, I'm, that's not what I'm really, be, I really feel this way. Okay. Own it. And if you're going to change yourself, if you're actually going to have this epiphany and you're going to live in a different way, at least become more feminine, at least because one thing that women don't can't wrap their heads around is the concept of value added. And so when like for a very long time, women, women object, sexually objectify themselves from the time they're, you know, 12 years old, all the way up until they're, 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 they're in their epiphany phase, right? They're in their 29 years old. Um, you make yourself a sexual commodity. Well, that's all you are. You're just a hot piece of ass. Be more than just a hot piece of ass. Or be a hot piece of ass. Be as much as you can. You know, guys want that. But add, what else, to, what else can you do? What else can you do? What else do you bring to the table? Most women won't even think that way because they don't, well, they think, well, well you know, men should be after me, not the other way around. Well, okay, well, now the sexual dynamic, the selection dynamic has reversed. And if a guy is 36 years old and he's hitting his sexual market value peak, why are you the one he should commit to? Because you're a hot piece of ass? Maybe. But what else do you have? What else do you, are you, would you think you'd be a good mother? Do you come from a good family? Are you feminine? Do you want to do something for his express pleasure? That's one thing that a lot of women really can never get past. So look for a guy who is you're 29. Look for a guy who's 34 to 36 years old, but understand that that guy is now in these prime, in his peak sexual market value years, but also he's going to be looking for something that's more than just a hot piece of ass. If he has his shit together and he's a red pill guy and he understands the thing, you don't, I think a lot of women like make the mistake of looking for the most ignorant guy that they can find. And I don't mean like dumb as an in intellectual, I mean like dumb as in they don't know how the game is being played. Most guys, uh, hopefully more, more, more and more guys are understanding it now, but they want a guy who's still stupid. He, he's still idealistic. He still believes in idealistic love and he still thinks that women are believing in idealistic love. 
I think most women look for the dumb beta at that time. The guy who's got prospects, but he's still a dumb beta. He still believes in, in romantic gestures and shit like that. That is a recipe for disaster, particularly if you're trying to convince yourself at the same time that you're, I'm going to get right with God before I do anything. So and there's something to think about. Thank you guys. Oh my goodness. Look at all this shit. Sorry guys. I'm, I'll, I'll catch up. I'll catch up. Um, where else have I got? Okay. Good vibrations. Okay. So that was Dante Nero. Oh, the future uh, in Capacia, Capacia. Uh, the future looks bleak. Demographic collapse, low birth rates. Yeah. Low marriage, now poly, okay, uh, 80 to 20 or 80, 20 rule. Yeah. If you had a magic wand, what would you do to repair the mating market between men and women? I would, well, here's a good thing. I would, I would say that if I had a magic wand, I would, I would try to, I would, I would grant everyone in humanity the capacity to understand that men and women are compliments to each other. They are not equals to each other. Here's what I do. I would take my magic wand and I would erase blank slate equalism. I would erase any notion that social constructionism should be the basis to build the society on. You want to know why we're in all this bullshit right now? It's big, simple, two simple facts. People still to this day believe in the blank slate. They still to this day still think that everything is about this nebulous, ambiguous society. Society is like a container. Or like, oh, thank you, Ryan Stone, is a container word. Put anything you want into blame society. Society says society makes you men chauvinist. Society says that uh, that you should only find you know Barbie doll, Playboy centerfolds attractive. You should have me as attractive because even though I've got more to love, like that kind of stuff, that's social constructionism. Uh, same thing with um. Well, I, I, and that's one of the conflicts I see with this gender the dysphoria stuff is um, we we want to believe that gender is a social construct, social constructionism. Um, but yet we're born into the wrong bodies, we're born the wrong sex. No, either it's biological or, or it's a social construct. Don't give me this horseshit about I was born or whatever. Um, so I would my wave my magic wand and I would erase blank slate equalism and and any notion of egalitarianism and replace it with a better understanding of biological, psychological, evolutionary understanding of the nature of men and women. That's what I would do. And that I would that solve everything? No, but I think that it would at least be put us on the path to living better lives. Uh, Dan Avita, any advice on dealing with jealous women? Uh, keeping my frame and holding my ground, but always a fight. Trying to talk it out, but I'm not sacrificing my machismo. Well, don't. You shouldn't. Matter of fact, I think that maintaining your identity or masculine identity is probably the best advice that I can give you. Uh, so advice dealing with jealous women. Okay, let's let's analyze that a little bit. Um, I don't think I've talked about jealousy in a while. <clears throat> jealousy is an evolved ad adaptive aspect of human nature, of our emotional nature. In our evolutionary past, in our in our hunter gatherer day, or let's say our ancestral past. I think that's the the proper term. In our ancestral past, um, it behooved men to be jealous. There was something about jealous, and women too, but since we're talking, you're a guy, so um, it behooved men to be jealous. Why? Well, it jealousy is based on that suspicion. It's it's a jealousy really, and there's a lot of a lot that's been written on this. Is jealousy is theoretically a um, an adaptation to uh, ensure that paternity is the number one thing in a guy's life. So why do you get jealous of somebody? Why do you, why do you, why would you get jealous of a woman? Well, it means that like you can't trust her. You can't, you like, is she, what, what is jealousy about? Is it jealousy can be about a lot of things. I'm, I'm thinking for, cause you have phrased this in inner intersexual dynamics here with, you know, jealousy of women. You can be jealous of your friend because he's got a better car than you or something like that. You can, there's still aspects of jealousy that don't have to do with the sexual marketplace. But in this case, um, there's that jealousy. Um, and women dealing who are jealous of you, they want to keep, they want, if, if women are jealous because they want to keep the guy who is, the, they want to have a commitment from a guy who is a good prospect for them in the long term. 
So that's why they will, that's why they, the claws will come out. That's why uh, women will um, fight for that. It's, it's really about mate guarding, right? It's the same thing for men too, but for women, when women are jealous of other women, then they, it, it's mostly because they don't want other women to get the resources and the attention and the love and the sex from a guy who has already triggered their, um, they're already passed all of the hypergamous tests let's just say a guy who is more hypergamously optimal is a man who will inspire more jealousy in a woman uh i've said this before and a lot of uh, and pat campbell's giving me grief grief about this too but um and i i still hold to this um, mystery back in the day said that a woman cannot love you unless she feels jealousy for you. And I 100% agree with that. People think that jealousy is this unhealthy thing. Well, it can be. The fallout of it can be because jealousy can lead you to some very antisocial behaviors such as murder <laughs> or uh, you know, cheating on your spouse or, or retaliation or stealing. Jealousy has a, has a lot to do with that. If it's, if it's about resources, it might be about stealing. But jealousy is something that uh, has been a part of human nature because it was successful. And people want to say, well, that's immoral. I can't believe you're saying, well, I'm, I'm not saying be jealous. I'm just saying that the reason that it exists is because it has been helpful to us as a species in our own survival for a very long time. So there's jealousies. We like to think of it as antisocial and it's immoral or unethical or well, you shouldn't be jealous. Well, you know, or you I guess you're insecure, right? Remember, you're so insecure in your masculinity. <laughs> you're jealous. Well, you're, you're jealous. As a man, men get jealous because they're also mate guarding. They feel that jealousy because they see all these external cues that they're, they're, wives or their girlfriends are like ovulation maybe they're ovulating right maybe it's the that that part of their menstrual cycle like i was talking about before and they um they want to uh to guard that they they that's particularly if it's a guy who is not really high on the sociosexual hierarchy those guys are going to tend to want to mate guard more often than a guy who has access to a lot of women so you'll see that mate guarding come out and that mate guarding starts with suspicion and jealousy and i really kind of run i'm running kind of those two definitions together um we we suspect like infidelity or we're jealous or we, we don't want her to be with any other guy why well because if she's with another guy it's possible that she gets pregnant with that other guy and you are the one who's still with her and you're stuck uh, and this is from an evolutionary standpoint, you're stuck raising the child of another man. That's why you feel jealousy. It's all about, it's all about the babies, right? It's all about ensuring that the babies are yours. So that's why you feel jealousy. But here's the thing is uh, you're uh, holding your ground, but always, uh, always a fight. Yeah. Okay. Trying to talk it out, but I'm, okay, don't talk it out, dude. <sighs> okay, thank you for the 50 bucks. So I'm going to give you a little bit extra here. Um, First of all, don't sacrifice your machismo, but don't sacrifice your identity because the moment you do, that's when she loses respect for you, and that's when you really will be shit out of luck. Okay, but don't try to talk it out. This is the egalitarian shit again. This is the um, this is that if we talk, oh, if open communication solves everything, no, it doesn't solve everything. Remember, it's not that you communicate; it's what you are communicating. So, yeah, why are you getting in a fight? Well, it's what you're communicating. That's why, okay? Um, don't you're, you're doing what's, what's called appeals to reason. Never appeal to a woman's reason because you will be disappointed every time that you do. Because, because, people, because people believe in this blank slate nonsense, they think that men and women are equal, co-equal, co-rational, you know, independent agents, and that if you're talking to her as a man who is a reasonable, intelligent, rational man, that all you have to do is sit her down at the other side of the table, explain your side of the story, and she'll rationally see your side of it, and you can come to a better agreement and live a better life. No, it doesn't, this is not how it works, man, uh, which I'm going to explain to you why here in just a second. Thanks for that 50 bucks, though. Um, Gravity Walker says, hi, Rolo, would you be willing to interview a guy I know for your red pill and religion series, Eastern versus Western Catholicism? Yeah, I would. Um, go ahead and uh, put, again, email me is the best thing you can do. If you ever, anybody wants to email me, you can. I am rt 
rationalmail at gmail.com. Send me that. Send me some info. I'll, I'll be happy to check them out. Oh, what else? What else? What else? Oh, I got Australian money. Thomas, I think this is a Australia. Rolo, thank you for taking the time to answer my simple question on another video. Oh, you're welcome. By the way, I really think you could have a good experience on Joe Rogan experience. Yeah, yeah, I could, right? Um, we'll see. I want to. I, 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 it's not, it's not for a lack of not wanting to. I would love to. Um, I have reached out, but I don't want to seem like I'm like needy or begging or anything like that. I'm glad that um, Hotep Jesus got on there too. That, that's almost seems like a man. Like I don't, I don't know if Hotep actually considers himself part of the manosphere, but as far as I'm concerned, that's kind of like a victory for the manosphere. It was nice of him to drop my name right in the middle of that show too. So thanks, Brian. Um, so I wanted to. We were, we're just talking about like appeals to reason and uh, guys thinking that women are co-equal, co-rational agents. Um, this, the reason for this, the reason like we're going to say, I'm going to wave my magic wand and erase blank, blank slate equalism. That's why I said that, because guys still cling to the same idea that, that men and women are equals. That there has to be so, like for any reaction, there's an equal and opposite reaction. The longer that you believe in egalitarianism and the longer that you believe in equalism as a way to like run your life or whatever, or or or, or um, run a society, um, you are simply signing over your authority and your your identity to the feminine. Because if a man is not, if a man can't be a man as he as a man, if a man can't be masculine, can't be conventionally masculine in a natural, you know, according to a male human nature, um, then all you're doing is signing away your your I don't say birthright, but you're signing away your uh, any claim to authority that you could possibly have. Because if you even if you have a, an egalitarian society, women will always control the egalitarian society because of the sex thing. Um, and that's going to sound really Freudian right there, but um, because of the sex thing, men will do pretty much anything to get laid. And it's still even in an egalitarian society, it still puts the men still have a burden of, of performance and women still have have primary control over those men because men have to qualify. The dynamic is men display women select, at least until, you know, till they get to an age where they can't select as well anyways. Um, so why do I say that? Well, that comes back to human nature. And I'm not saying like I'm this expert on human nature, but I can give you my take on human nature. And I still think that from a perspective of psychology is concerned, this is the way I, I look at psychology. And if you've read any of these, these posts, um, you'll be familiar with this stuff. I wrote a series of posts called Instinct, Emotion, and Reason. And the, I've done four, it was a four-part series. And I think it might be about a year old right now. And I really think it's a fantastic series, even if I do say so myself, because I, I kind of break down um, like the way that we interpret information or things that come to us from the outside. Like when we're interpreting work in behavioral sense, in behavioral psychology terms, it's like stimuli and response, right? So how do we respond to stimuli? Well, first thing that happens is we respond to things instinctually, the way that we are born, the way that our, just as our, 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 our biological hardware is, is concerned. So there's instinct, emotion, and reason, and then I'm also going to go into this, is that there is the hardware, there is the firmware, and there's the software. If that sounds like a computer, you're right, okay? So there's the actual physical side of the person. There's the firmware, which is the, the instinctual stuff that you're born with, um, to uh, here's here's an example when something flies at your face somebody throws something at you or a rock comes at you you know or, or, or a fly comes around you're like ah eh, get away from me like that kind of stuff that's instinctual that's that's something that you didn't have to learn you just do it because it's just what humans have always done there's other instinctual sides uh, other instinctual proclivities that both men and women have like for 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 boys, when boys come out of the womb, like there's a men have a natural proclivity to be able to throw a rock with their shoulders more accurately than girls do. Like when we say, "Oh, you throw like a girl," right? that's where that comes from. You can teach a girl how to throw like a boy, but the boy comes out with a natural proclivity. He already knows. He's boys. Men tend to tend to be more focused on things. They have a better understanding of 
rationality, like uh, when it comes to math. So um, when that guy got, I forget what, what the professor's name was, the professor that, that said, oh yeah, men have a natural ability for math. They do. And statistically, it's proven. And there's nothing wrong with saying that. But he lost his job or he lost his tenure because he said something like that, because we want to pretend that everything's egalitarian and equal. That's not to say that women can't be good mathematicians. They can. It's just that they don't have the natural proclivity for it. So maybe they can override that with the software. So you can have, um, I'll give you an example here. This is, this is a really good, good example, I think. Um, when, you do, uh, when you do martial arts, uh, you, most human beings are averse to like conflict. They don't want, you know, unless you're like really aggressive or whatever. Um, most human beings like try to avoid danger. Well, what martial arts does is it reconditions that firmware to say, face the danger, be brave, stay out there. You're conditioned. You know how to handle a fight. You know how to handle yourself in a fight. Another good one is, and that, so what you have is you have learned rational, well, this is the rational side, learned rational um, skills and behaviors that can override your firmware that is, you know, flinch to stay away, to get away. So you can override those things by learning certain skills. Um, you can do the same thing with, um, like when you're you ever, anybody ever taken a driver's test and what do they tell you when, excuse me, when they tell you when you're in a skid, like if you're on ice and you're in a skid, they tell you to turn into the skid and don't put the brakes on because if you do, you'll, start spinning around right <clears throat> but but your natural your 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 gut says no 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 put the brakes on stop you know turn turn with the skid right and you all you do is make things worse well if you train yourself to turn into the skid then you drift right and then you, then you then you get into that kind of stuff um but your natural instinct is to put the slam the brakes on and to turn with the skid so that you will stop right but that's the worst thing you can do well, again, it's teaching a behavior, teaching a set of behaviors that will contradict your firmware. So your software overrides a firmware. So can you teach a girl to throw like a boy? Yes, but she doesn't have that natural proclivity. Her firmware is not to naturally throw a ball accurately or throw it, but you can a woman still be a pitcher? Sure, she can then, but you just have to learn how to override that. That doesn't mean that the natural proclivity isn't valid, it is. For women, their natural proclivities is, is uh, women tend to be more focused on people. They have a greater understanding or greater capacity for communication. So they see things. I mean, you know, we talk about what feminine intuition isn't really intuition at all. It's just it's just women have a better well, maybe they do. They have a better um, understanding of sub communications, of uh, visual communications, vocal intonations. They get more out of a look than than men do. Right. So we we communicate overtly men, women can communicate covertly. And so can you teach a man to be more sensitive to, uh, you know, to be more uh, to have a communicate, have better communication skills? Sure. Yeah, you can. But he doesn't have the natural proclivity. Women do. So the, you, you can override those things. You can override the um, the the firmware with software. So that's I, I want to throw that out there because it goes back to what I'm okay catch up hang on one guy hang on guys i'm sorry about this which one is this oh, that was dan's sorry um, uh darius thurman thank you brother uh it says do men ever hit the wall if a man is in the bottom 80 percent of smv has he hit the wall uh the wall for men is like for men's sexual market value peak i've always pegged sexual market value peak at about 36 years old uh, I think men have a burden of performance. I think men have, depending on who they are. I mean, if you, if we're going to talk about this a little bit more, I think, on Saturday's uh, Rule Zero show with Rich Cooper, because Rich is very um, enthusiastic when it comes to do the work. And I think that if there is a male wall, it comes much later in life. I think men have a greater potential to build themselves into something more than women do because men tend to base their, uh, they, they tend to base their ratings of like sexual market value for women based on sexual availability and sexual fitness. How hot is she and how ready is she? That's pretty much it. For guys, there's a lot more to it. When men will say, well, why did you pick 36, you know, why don't you say 26, man? Guys are in 26, they're better looking than 36. Well, 
Yeah, but the guy at 26 doesn't have, hasn't matured and doesn't have the better, doesn't have the same, the same experience that a guy who's 36 does. A guy who's 36, maybe he's made partner in the, you know, in the, in the law firm. Maybe he's done more with himself. It takes women on instinctively. I was just telling what it was. I, t- I just told Susie a minute ago, you know, you go for a guy who's five to seven years older. Most women will do that anyways, because women understand that it takes longer for a man to mature. It takes longer for a guy to have all of the things that make him his most attractive during his lifetime. So that's why I say 36 is, is your peak. Now, can you screw yourself? Yeah. And lots of guys have, lots of guys do. If you're below that, if you're in the bottom 80% as you SMV and you hit the wall, maybe, but that doesn't mean, I think that unless you are like, you know, physically deformed <laughs> unless you and even then you know, unless you are physically deformed i think men have a greater potential to be more than that 80 percent than women will so i think that's one of the reasons why women have to convince themselves that they are still sexually viable and by convincing themselves that they're in their sexual peak when they get to be like 30 or 40 years old it's nonsense um, but it sounds good and it makes them feel better so whatever but Men have a burden of performance and men have a burden of really potential, a a curse of potential and the burden of performance. I think that's, those are the two essays that I wrote. So, um, so as long as you're, you know, as long as you, you can make the most of yourself as a man long for longer than you can as a woman. So maybe that's the best way of saying that. Uh, Let me catch up here. Mr. Handsome. Hey, Rolla, thanks for the content. Can you quickly touch on the main difference between trad cons and red pill aware? Um, gosh, I'm, I'm going to talk about being red pill aware tomorrow or excuse me, not tomorrow on uh, Saturday with um, Rich Cooper on Rich Cooper's channel for rule zero. So um, I think that and we'll, we'll, I'll tell you what, let me make a deal with you. I promise you, Mr. Handsome, I will write that down and I will answer that on that show because I think that is probably the better place for it. Um, just briefly, I think trad cons can be red pill aware. It's just how they apply that. Same thing with MGTOWs, same thing with, with purple pill guys. They can be red pill aware and still use that awareness or deny that awareness in various ways. Um, but I, I actually tune in on, on Saturday. It's at 1130 AM Eastern on Saturday. It's going to be on rich Cooper's entrepreneurs and cars channel. And I guarantee you, it's going to be a hot show. Uh, let's see what I got here. Oh, I think I've caught up. Okay. So here we go. When I'm talking about instinct and emotion and reason, there's, different ways that we handle those I call, I call them interpretive processes this is just me just like spitballing things here okay so there's the instinctual side of our natures there's the emotional side emotions are not magic emotions are not some blessing from you know whatever deity you revere okay i can make you feel something by changing your biochemistry I can make you feel more comfortable and more trusting if I introduce oxytocin into your bloodstream. I can make you feel more aggressive and more uh, more horny <laughs> by putting testosterone into your into your bloodstream. I can change the way you feel by manipulating and stimulating parts of your brain. It is a physical process that you have that. But emotions are how we interpret the world around us, how we interpret stimuli. So it is an interpretive process, but you see something, it triggers a hormone release. So you'll feel something. So when guys see a centerfold and they get a hard on, that's a condition, well, an unconditioned response to something that you are, uh, that, that presets you for pleasure, presets you for, because, because biology wants you to have, evolution wants you to have babies. Okay. So it preps you for potential pleasure. That's one aspect of it. There's other, you you can also have the fight or flight um, response that can also trigger emotions. How do you feel about stuff? What, why do we get hangry when we're hungry? You know, well, because we're hungry. We want, if if we're angry or we're going to be more in a in a state, a physical state where we can go and hunt something down, kill it and eat it because we're hungry and we're angry. <laughs> so there's, there's 
parts of that. I, I'm, I'm probably making, I'm butchering this really, but that's that's the simplistic way of saying, you know, that emotions are an interpretive process and they are not some metaphysical thing. They are an actual physical aspect. So um, when we feel love for a woman or man, um, it is based on pair bonding or keeping those keeping those two together to ensure the survival of any offspring that they have. And that's the nuts and bolts probably the impersonal way of describing love there's i think there's more to it than that but um from a physical evolutionary standpoint that's what keeps you love will keep us together um and then there's the rational side of things rational side co corresponds with um the software side of things so the thing about rationality is it takes longer it takes longer for you to learn those things and then apply what you've learned and then it takes experimentation. So if, you're, if your rational mind is wrong about something and you experiment with it and you die as a result of it, well, you're kind of screwed. Uh, unless somebody else learns from it that was in the periphery somewhere. So there's the rational side of things that takes longer. And the rational side helps you live a better life. It helps you understand things. It helps you um, maybe put under control your instinct, put under control your emotions. Now, when I look at the differences between men and women, men tend to prioritize instinct, reason, and then emotion. For women, it's the opposite. It's instinct, emotion, and then reason. And that's not to say that women can't learn to reprioritize. They can, but just naturally, out of the womb, your starting, your open, your starting packages, and that's what you get. And so I think right now, when I was asking you know, the guy was asking me about you know the feminine controlled society a little while ago, I think that we have adopted a social architecture based on instinct, emotion, and reason. We want we have a we live in a gynocentric society. We live in a feminine primary social order. Well, what does that mean? That means that we follow the nature of women, the female nature of women in the larger societal context as opposed to the male context which was the way we used to do it which was prior to the sexual revolution that's why i mentioned the sexual revolution at the beginning of this so that's kind of in a nutshell my my view on uh my personal view on psychology and behaviorism uh and a lot of the stuff that i work on a lot of the stuff that i talk about has that root in that now, I want to move on to why it is that I don't have a lot of love for Carl Jung. Carl Jung is sort of the messiah of this feminine primary social order that I was talking about. Um, people want to say, well, he's contributed a lot to psychology. Yeah, he has. So has, so has Sigma Freud. So has Maslow. So has B.F. Skinner. So, uh, I mean, these are all first year. These, these are the guys, the, you know, the, the rock stars that you learn about when you're a first year psychology student. Yeah. Okay. I'm not saying that, you know, Jung didn't have some contributions. He did, but by and large, a lot of his stuff was really kind of hippy dippy, magical, metaphysical bullshit. And, um, I'm going to read some stuff here from his, from the Wik Wikipedia page here and let you guys sort of decide why we, why do we even take this guy seriously now? Now, I'm going to also add a few things here. I just want to, before I dig in here, I don't want to, this is not going to be just sort of this takedown video of Carl Jung, okay? I, I, I definitely think that he's made some contributions, okay? Simple as that. Jordan Peterson champions Carl Jung. Yes, he does. He worships Carl Jung. He wants to be Carl Jung. He, I think he would like to be seen as the Carl Jung of the 21st century. Uh, and so a lot of, a lot of his stuff and, and a lot of humanist, psychotherapy comes from Jungian theory. And let's just be clear about that. It is theory. It is not some, there's not, there are not laws. Okay. When somebody says to me, Oh, there's the, you need to get in touch with your feminine side. Okay. You know what that is? That's anima animus. That's like, that's this idea that men and women have these intrinsic balances or they should have these intrinsic balances between feminine and masculine or maybe maybe they have like you're 80 percent masculine and you're 20 percent feminine or maybe you're just 20 percent maybe you're 100 percent feminine and you're in a, a masculine body that's where a lot of this social constructionist theory comes from so all of this is dependent on the blank slate and that's why i made a big deal about the blank slate 
well, I've written about it, but in, in the beginning of this show, um, that's why I think the black, blank state needs to die. And if you've read anything by um, Stephen Pink or you, particularly his book, The Blank Slate, you'll understand what I mean here. It is a modern denial of human nature is what it is, in spite of mounds of empirical evidence, mounds of studies. We, we can map the human genome now. We can we understand uh, we have fMRI studies now. We can see how the human brain is connected and we can see it all in 3D and we can build you know models based on it. So we have we have technological abilities right now in 2020 soon to be 2020 um that maslow and jung and freud couldn't even dream of of thinking about that, that we would actually have that or we have also we have an understanding of anthropology that they never had any grasp of we have the understanding of sociology evolutionary psychology evolutionary biology we have all of the all of the stuff that i think leads into that that builds on this this under this red pill understanding of intersexual dynamics is based as far as i'm concerned I mean, what i'm writing anyways is based and rooted in empiricism it's rooted in the science and the understanding that we have today does that mean that their stuff is is worthless no i'm not saying it's worthless they may like i said they made a contribution but it's time to move on it's time to move past Jung. It's time to move past Freud. It's time to move past freaking even B.F. Skinner. It's time to move past that bullshit, okay? Because we have a better understanding of it. It's, it's well past time. I, again, I want to wave my magic wand and erase blank slate equalism because I think that if we're going to live better lives, if we're going to have a better society, we can't. We got to get rid of this bullshit um, social constructionism and we got to get rid of the blank slate. And a lot of people aren't willing to do that because it's uncomfortable, because it threatens the existence of them of their of themselves. It's how they how they grew up. When somebody like they've been saying, I, I think that the the term or the the idea that men need to get in touch with their feminine side, they need to be, you know, they they need to grow and, and be more sensitive and that kind of stuff. All of that goes back to anima animus. And that anima animus is based on the understanding that men and women at least have the potential to be equals, to have, have the, the, the potential to have um, co-equal, co-rational, you know, lives. And that if you are a masculine presenting woman, then that means that the, you know, your fem your masculine side is, is outweighs your feminine side. And, and they don't, rather than just rather than questioning the whole concept of do we even have this is that even is that are those even like constructs at all we don't the, the idea that that might be bullshit is just like a bridge too far it's just too much to say like when when i when i get um when i get uh critical of myers briggs of this bullshit idea based on again on jungian archetypes on based on all this other stuff <clears throat> I, I'm not saying like big five personality disorder or, or disorder per personality traits don't exist. They do, but to what degree are they based on a, are they based on an understanding of empirical, like empirical knowledge about human brains? Is it, is it about like, is, is it rooted in empiricism or is it rooted in hopeful metaphysics? And I think that that's that's really the root of my problem with Jung. There's I'll, I'll, I'm going to read some other stuff here in a second um, about another reason why I have a problem with Jung. Uh, Good vibration says my childhood friend double majored in sociology and psychology and is becoming a communist. How can I use psychology to show him the error of his ways? Um, well, the problem that you're going to have in that instance is that most modern psychology is taught from the perspective of um, touchy feely humanism. And most academia is rooted, firmly rooted in, um, in the feminine imperative. So even the hard sciences, even STEM fields right now, if you don't present your work or your research, your research won't get funded in, in, uh, in STEM or you won't, you'll be graded lower, whatever, if you don't, if you don't operate within a, within a feminine context, within a, I shouldn't say feminine, uh, within a, uh, within a socially social justice consciousness if you're not presenting in those in the in that context 
then your work's going to go down a memory hole or you're not going to be, or you're not, we're going to be graded lower or your studies aren't simply going to get, simply aren't going to get funded. So how do you do that with psychology? I would say, make sure you stick to nuts and bolts, stick to behaviorism, stick to evolutionary psychology, stick to, um, uh, again, empiricism, because probably the, the reason they're coming to this idea of, of like communism or, or socialism or social Marxism and stuff like that, um, is generally due to this belief in social constructionism or blank slate equalism. Destroy blank slate equalism and you destroy the arguments that they have. Uh, let's see. Greyhound dogs are the best. Mine are red pilled. Are they? Thank you. I do think so. Oh, and you got a, oh man, you got a, is that a white greyhound in your thing? Thanks, Oliver. Yes, my greyhounds are the best. I don't know about your greyhounds, but mine are. Um, is it doomed for women after 30? <laughs> is it doomed? Uh, no, you're not doomed after 30. You just have a, a tougher row to hoe, I think. Um, you, are you doomed after 30? No, you're not doomed after you, you life's what you freaking make of it. All right. So if you, I'm, this is Susie, by the way, this isn't a dude, this is a chick asking if she's doomed after 30. Um, I don't know. Are you in shape? Are you, uh, are, do you have any other value added? Did you listen to anything I said when you per, put your first, <laughs> put your first comment in, um, value added, get yourself together, add value to yourself, become the woman that a guy will want to commit to and really do it. Don't make it an act, really be that find the guy that you, you know, that you want to get with and become something more than just three holes. Right. I mean, that's the that's the Patrice O'Neill thing. Right? You, you women reduce themselves to a series of holes. If you didn't have a vagina, how would you please your man? Oh, I give him give him head. I give him the ass. Whatever. So you, basically your value is three holes, two holes, one hole. Um, try thinking in, in terms that are a little bit more than that. All right, so I'm going to read something to you here. I already have it set up. I'm going to set this up here. Um, oh shit, you guys are going to have to bear with me because I'm going to have to read it from the other screen here. Um, this is from the Wikipedia page of Carl Jung, and I thought I'd give you guys a little bit of history on Mr. Jung. And one of the reasons why I think that he was a high-functioning beta and certainly very blue pill, but he was also... Um, I, I've I've said this before. He's he's got beta game, or he's got blue pill. Well, not blue. He's got beta game, and this is. I'll explain to you why in a minute here. Okay, so when I'm talking about his childhood, I, I don't want to give you like I don't want to bore you. This isn't a history lesson or anything like that. But when when Jung was six years old, his father was appointed to a more prestigious parish because his father was was a, a religious guy, um, and the tension between his parents was growing. Emil Jung was an eccentric and depressed woman. This is his mom. She spent considerable time in her bedroom where she said that spirits visited her at night. Although she was normal during the day, Jung recalled that at night his mother became strange and mysterious. He reported that one night he saw a faintly luminous indefinite figure coming from her room with a head detached from the neck and floating in the air in front of the body. Jung had a better relationship with his father. Okay, that's exhibit A. Jung's mother left Lof, Lofen, Lofen, I'm probably going to, they're German, right? Or Belgium. Well, for several months of hospitalization near Basel. Basel. Um, no, it was no, uh, for an unknown physical ailment. His father took the boy to be cared for by Emil Jung's unmarried sister in Basel. Uh, but he was later brought back to his father's residence. Jung's continuous bouts of absence, uh, Emil Jung's continuing bouts of absence and depression deeply troubled her son and because and caused him to associate women with an innate unreliability, whereas his father <clears throat> meant for him uh, reliability, but also powerlessness. So does that sound to you like maybe um, dad is reliable, but he's more of like the reliable, dutiful beta? That these are questions I'm just going to ask along the way here. Um, mom is unreliable. Dad is reliable, but beta. In his memoir, Jung would remark that 
his parent his parental influence was the handicap I started off with. Later, these early impressions were revised. I have trusted men, friends, and been disappointed by them. I have mistrusted women and not and was not disappointed. So to me, it seems like he's got sort of a he's got a thing for women. And this this sounds to me as like early gynocentrism. It sounds so I remember this is back in uh when is this the the late 1800s is when is this going on um i believe or maybe it's the early 1900s anyways um so this is after after three years of living in love and paul paul Jung, i guess that's his father requested for transfer okay so in 1879 here we go uh was called to klein hungen uh, near basil where his family lived as a parsonage in the church the relocation brought Emil Jung closer in contact with her family and lifted her melancholy. When he was nine years old, Jung's sister, jo Johanna Gertrude, was born. Known in the family as Trudy, she later became a secretary to her brother. Okay. Memories of childhood. This is the part I wanted to get to. Jung was a solitary and introverted child. From childhood, he believed that his mother... Uh, he believed that, like his mother, he had two personalities, a modern Swiss citizen and a, person, a personality more suited to the 18th century. Personality number one, as he termed it, was a typical schoolboy living in the era of our time. Personality number two was a dignified, authoritative, authoritative and influential man from the past. Although Jung was close to, his, to both parents, he was disappointed by his father's academic approach to faith. Okay, sound like a guy who's rooted in faith from a very early age? Maybe. A number of childhood memories made lifelong impressions on him. And this is where I wanted to get to. As a boy, he carved a tiny mannequin into the end of a wooden ruler from his pencil case and placed it inside the case. He added a stone, which he had painted into upper and lower halves and hid the, the case in the attic. Periodically, he would return to the mannequin, often bringing tiny sheets of paper with messages inscribed on them in his own secret language. Kind of advanced for a, a, a boy that age, but think about this. So, okay, he later reflected that this ceremonial act brought him a feeling of inner peace and security. Years later, he discovered similarities between his personal experiences and the practices associated with totems in indigenous cultures. I should also add here right now is like, don't they, I don't know, some, maybe my, my rabbi friend will tell me, you know, in the wailing wall, don't they like fold up prayers and like in little pieces of paper and they put them in the, they put them in the wall. It sounds a lot like that. Uh, he later painted, oh, excuse me, he later reflected on this ceremonial tone. Okay, such as a collection of soul stones, soul stones near Arlsheim or the Tuguras, Tuyunga, Turungas of Australia. I don't know what that is. He later, oh, he concluded that his intuitive ceremonial act was an unconscious ritual which he had practiced in a way that was strikingly similar to those distant locations which he, as a young boy, knew nothing about. His observations about symbols, archetypes, and the collective unconscious were, were inspired in part by these experiences combined with his later research. Okay, I, this is the one part where I think that Jung has a decent contribution here. Univ well, I say universal, but symbols, archetypes, and collective unconscious. Now, I think that he wanted to apply this mysticism to... Um, to what we would later discover is something that what I was just talking about before natural proclivities. What are the natural, what is the nature of men and women? Why do, why are women's brains wired differently than men's? Why is it that women uh, women process negative emotions differently from men? Why? It's not because of some cultural understandings because that is the, that is the way we're born. That is the, that is the, um, I think they've, they've even done studies where um, brain studies, brain scans of kids in the womb and the gender differences in those brain scans start in the womb, not learned, start in the womb. And I'll, I'll, I'll throw out, if anybody wants me to, me to give you some, some good references between the physical, biological, and psychological differences between men and, men and women, 
um, I can do that for you. There's, there's a lot of research on this, and particularly more now. This is another reason why I say we need to start focusing or start developing a, a, a psychology based on the empirical evidence that we have today, not on hokum, not on metaphysics, not on astrology, not on occult crap. Okay. We need to build it on a, a, an empirical understanding. Right? Anyways, that's just me pontificating one more time. <clears throat> so anyways, I, I, I wanted to throw that out there because I do think that a lot of, uh, like he hit upon the idea of archetypes, which I think in some ways has some merit to it, but the source of those archetypes is what I would disagree with. And remember, archetypes is not something, it's not a term that he came up with. Archetypes is actually a, um, a term that was originated in anthropology, not in psychology. Uh, because there are certain reoccurring archetypes across the, across the planet, all, all of humankind, right? We all, like when we look at like different myths, when we look at like uh, the, the Northern, or like Odin and, and, um, one I'm fond of, right? Uh, we look at the Norse myths and you look at the comparison to like, say the Greek myths or the myths of um, Mesoamerica or of, uh, or of Native Americans or even Oriental myths, Asian myths, Japanese myths. Um, they all have a lot of commonality. Uh, I don't want to give too much away because a lot of this I get into in book four, then I, and, and I don't ruin the surprise. It's going to be cool. Um, but those archetypes are not something that is mystical and fantastical. And they are something that is really, I think, in this, in the, again, to Jung's credit, this is him recognizing these commonalities in human experience. Now, are they because of a blank slate? No, I don't think so. I think, it, if anything, it proves the opposite. It proves that archetypes for men and archetypes for women follow those natural proclivities and follow the way that men and women process emotion, process their experiences as women, as men, um, and such. So I, I, again, credit where it's due archetypes, I think is one of the aspects that is a collective unconscious, collective unconscious, right? Again, what are the commonalities of experience that human beings have, no matter what culture they're from, no matter what, what continent they're on. Okay. Humans are humans. So, all right. Uh, at the age of 12, shortly after the end of the first uh, of his first year at the Humanashkish uh, Gymnasium in Basil Young was pushed to the ground by another boy so hard he momentarily lost consciousness. Jung later recognized that the incident was indirectly his fault. A, a thought came to him. Uh, excuse me. A thought came to him. Now you don't have to go to school anymore. From then on, whenever he walked to school or began homework, he fainted. <laughs> he remained at home for the next six months until his, uh, he overheard his father speaking hurriedly to a visitor about the boy's future ability to support himself. The sus they suspected he had epilepsy. Confronted with the reality of his family's poverty, he realized the need for academic excellence. He went into his father's study and began poring over Latin grammar. He fainted three more times, but eventually became overcame the urge and did not faint again. This event, uh, Jung recall, later recalled, was when I learned what a neurosis is. So you have a neurotic kid. I mean, liter I mean literally, he's, he's admitting to a form of neurosis. And... I think that a lot of people, when they think of Jung, they only think of him in, in like maybe in archetypes or, or things like that. I think we sort of deify Jung because a lot of what his, a lot of his theories have become laws. I think that the, I think that feminism certainly picked up on this. Anything that is reliant upon blank slate equalism tends to lean towards Jung. Um, I, I think that a lot of his later work is really more hocus pocus, magical mysticism. Um, God Saad won't even talk about Jung because he says it's just too ridiculous to even, you know, grant a uh, a response to. But and, and I understand why. But I think that we do need to have the conversation about Jung and the influence that he's had on the modern idea of men and women. 
on believing that men and women have masculine and feminine parts. Well, according to the way, according to our natural proclivities, according to our, I mean, can we, can you condition those natural proclivities out? Yeah, you could, but should we? And I think that this is, this is a question we need to ask ourselves very, very soon. Um, I, I forget who was asking me about the, uh, you know, waving the magic wand and making uh, something appear or maybe, you know, getting rid of, so can a psychologist turn you into a beta male? Um, oh, okay. I'll, I'll talk about the books uh, here before I go. I, I promise. Um, uh, Sam Whiskey, can psychologists turn you into beta male? Yeah, they can. Why? How, how can that happen? That's a good, uh, that's a good jump point here. How could that happen? How can a, uh, how can a psychologist turn you, turn you beta? Well, I think your teachers, your family, they can, they can turn you into a beta male. Oh man, I got, I got Pat calling me right now. Sorry, Pat. I'm in the middle of a show. I'll call you right back, dude. Um, so yeah, I, I, I think I, I want, I'm gonna, I'm gonna leave this here, but I, I wanted to have, I want to sort of open a dialogue about Jung. Um, I still think that it's time to move on. It's time to push past, not to say like the, you know, it's a, people always give me this grief about like, well, you think you're smarter than, than Thomas Aquinas. You think you're smarter than Socrates and, and, uh, you know, Aristophanes or, you know, whoever, you know, Aristotle, you think you're smarter than Aristotle. I think I have access to information that Carl Jung and Aristotle and Thomas Aquinas didn't have at that time. They didn't have the understanding of those, of the, the human brain. They don't know anything about DNA. They don't know anything about sociology or archaeology or, or anthropology. Not saying that I am like, I've got, oh, I've got a greater IQ than these guys. I'm, this is not about IQ. This is about we're in an era where it's time to move on. It's time to push past blank slate equalism. It's time to push past this stuff. It's time to put to put Jung on a shelf, say he did his thing, but we need to we need to move on. And um, can a uh, can a psychologist turn you beta? Yeah, absolutely. I think I think if you look into and I would encourage anybody to go and check out the Wikipedia page for Carl Jung because if you look at his history, this is a beta kid. This is a very beta kid. And if you look at some of the, the patients that he took on, I mean, he was, he was nailing, I mean, he was in a poly relationship, right? I mean, he was nailing his patients um, while he was still married. And he, in some way, convinced his wife that to be cool with him having sex with his patients, who he later turned into psychologists themselves. So go ahead and look at some of those things. And you'll see a guy who learned early beta game, which is identify with the feminine, pretend to be on the woman's side. When we talk about, when we criticize um, male feminists, we say, oh, they're being sneaky. You know, they're, they're pretending to be on team woman and, and they're trying to, they're trying to get in their pants because by, by agreeing with them, by identifying with the feminine. I've, I've talked about this. I've, if you read the first book, I, I go into uh, there's a chapter called identity crisis. This goes back to union ideas is that, um, but the more we identify with the feminine, the more women will like us. There's been, there is no greater union idea than, than if I'm more like a woman, then women will and I identify being feminine because I believe that there's feminine and masculine sides to a person, then women will want to get with me because I won't be like other guys. I won't be like those overbearing assholes. I won't be like uh, those typical chauvinists. I, I'll, I'll give women what they want. I'll be more like a chick because they believe that likes attract. So, you know, that's beta game to me is what that is, is it's this identification game. It's, it's the more, it's, it's the belief that likes attract likes. And I don't think that that's true. I think that it's the differences between men and women that, that make men more attractive. The more masculine you are, the more the feminine wants to get with you and vice versa. You know, just, I was just giving some advice to Susie there a little while ago, talking about how you can, uh, you know, what can I do? Am I am I done at thirty? Well, here's the thing: is embrace your femininity, and ba and, and a lot of a lot of women are at a point in life because they've been conditioned for a very long time to think that, you know, doing anything for the express pleasure of a man is failure. That that they're going against the strong, independent woman narrative if they do something for the pleasure of a man. Well, what would that be? 
maybe being feminine. How would that be? Like, hey, maybe uh, maybe wearing something different, maybe talking different, maybe thinking different, maybe like embracing the natural femininity that you've been taught to repress for a long time. I think women have a real tough time getting back to really natural, you know, evolve femininity right now because they have a blue pill of their own. They have their own conditioning that says, you know, Disney's, you know, with every freaking new movie, Disney says, hey, you can be a warrior princess. You can do anything a man can. You don't need to be feminine. You can do everything. You can, you can beat men's ass if you want to. Yeah. And so you get a lifetime of that. You get to be 30 years old. And so if past 30 years or so, you've been listening to that. And then along comes Rolla Tomasi and says, you know what? You need to go back and, re and embrace your femininity. That could be a very tall order because you don't even know what it is. You never had experience. You never embraced it in the first place. So it feels like an act or it feels like it's fair. Well, that's just not me. No, that's not who you were conditioned to be. That's what it is. So um, anyways, I wanted to throw Jung out there. I'm not trying to throw him under the bus or anything, but people always want to know why I have a problem with him. I was like, I think it's time to move on. I, you know, I think it's time to move on past Freud. I think Freud had a lot of, uh, I think a lot of what Freud had to say had a lot of value, particularly now that we're in a more empirical era, or we should be in a more empirical era. And a lot of his stuff is is bearing fruit, I think. But we don't want, we want to say, oh, for Freud, because we think of Freud as being like the rational a-hole, right? We think that he's the guy who, who he had a split with, with Jung, because Jung was much more like the guru, hippie, you know, uh, spiritualist guy, whereas Freud was just everything was about pussy. And it's like, no, if you go and you look actually no to both of those guys. But if you go and you have any understanding of both of those guys, um, you know, Freud was Freud was on coke half the time. And they, they thought cocaine was great back then. They thought cocaine was the new wonder drug. You know, what, it's not like a, it's not like they do is like, you know, free base and coke and thinking like, oh, man, this, like he didn't know he's a drug addict because they thought coke was great back. They should they put coke in like coke in Coca-Cola. <laughs> but uh, but still um, the effects the same. So um, anyways, I wanted to throw that out there. I think that just sort of in closing here, um, I think that it's important that we. I think it's important that the red pill stays fundamentally a praxology. I don't want to invoke any kind of mysticism into it. I don't want to invoke any kind of uh, humanistic psychology into it. I'm not saying it doesn't have value. It does. But like when we look at, like we were just saying before, how people get a bad taste in their mouth when they, when they talk about um, marriage counseling or therapists. And we have that idea. Why, I mean, why do we have this? idea that psychologists are um are a bad thing well because we think it's pseudoscience right we think well why why do we think it's pseudoscience? why uh we think it's um it's the new religion it's it's like a, a replacement for religion same thing for evolution well, a revolution is trying to get rid of religion no it's not it's just trying to tell a story is what it's trying to do um and i think that we need to move on. We need. To, I think we we have we have an obligation to the truth, and part of that obligation is moving past, you know, theories of the past. So, uh, anyways, if you have questions about that, if you if you disagree with me, or if you think you know Jung is should be the new Messiah, um, I'm all ears. But um, that's my outlook when it comes to Jung. Um, I don't think he is. I don't think he is a messiah. I don't think he is. I, I, although I think that somebody like Jordan Peterson would like to would like us all to believe that he is. There's there's people who made much greater contributions than Jung. Than Jung. Jung. All right, guys. Anyways, it is coming up on hour number two. I have to finish things up and do a little bit of uh, housekeeping here, which is if you have not bought my books, please do. This is my my shameless plug. You have to sit through at the very end. See how nice I am. I don't do it at the beginning. I do it at the end. Um, please go to amazon.com. Uh, all of the, if you want to support this show, which th I should say, this is the premiere show of, of Rolo Solo. I like that. Or I might even call it that Rolo Solo, uh, the rational mail, me alone. Uh, I'm going to start doing some call in while well, the call. In, I, I, know, I, I might do call in. Here's the thing. I don't do call-ins because I'm the only person in this room right now. 
And I kind of need people to help me out with, uh, you know, call screening. I always need help um, in the chat because, um, and thank you for not spamming my chat today. Um, but it's distracting. And I understand why Donovan Sharp sort of put, you know, put that off, a responsibility off on Devin because uh, I get it. It's, it's really tough. Um, so I have a board. I, I've got a board. I can actually do phone calls. Uh, I might do, um, blog talk radio. We'll see how that works out. If I can swing it, I will. I know Rich does it, but I, to me, it's very distracting because the stuff that I talk about is very, as you know, very content heavy. Excuse me. And the way that I work, the way that I think is, um, I think like ch a chess player, I think, I think four steps ahead. And so I'm already thinking about what people are going to say about what the point I'm about to make and what they're going to criticize it. So I kind of try to head them off the pass kind of thing. That's how I write too. Um, <clears throat> speaking of which, I'll have a new uh, post coming out this weekend, um, if not tomorrow. Uh, and uh, let's see. So please, if, oh, here's the best way. If you want to, if you want to support the show, all of the links are in the description of this, uh, of the show. Um, I really appreciate the super chats because I'm pretty much demonetized. I mean, I'm a yellow, I'm yellow flagged on all of these things because I'm roll Tomasi, but um, I, I get very, very little money generated by this, this show, by this show. So if you want to help me out, the best way to do that is either give me a super chat or go buy the book and take the book and hand it off to your next friend. Uh, if you buy the physical copy, buy two so that you can hand one to your friend and then you can keep another one with your notes and your highlighting and, and your liner notes and all that other good stuff. Thanks, Alex, for that five bucks. Um, also, if you want to um, join me on Patreon, the link, again, is in the description here. And you can, uh, actually, I might as well just put that up there really quick. Uh, and this is, of course, my blog. If you're unfamiliar with my blog, why aren't you? Um, please go do that. I'm also, um, now on Facebook, just look me up. Uh, go to the uh, this Facebook group right here. This is the Rule Zero Facebook group. You'll find me on there, and then you can friend me all you would like. Um, I I try to friend everybody. I probably don't. That's probably the best, worst idea in the world is to friend everyone. But um, I'll be happy to be. I'll be your friend. Um, let's see what else. Um, so, oh, here we go. That's that's the one I wanted. Okay, uh, Amazon. This is where you can find my books. Uh, you can find all three of my books. I have The Rational Male, The Rational Male Preventive Medicine, and The Rational Male Positive Masculinity. And uh, I would say probably Q quarter one of 2020, you will get book four. I'm op optimistic about it. I'm very opt I was hoping to have it out by October, but editing is taking longer than I thought. And I had a lot of un unpredictable shit happen to me this year, as you probably all know. So um let's see what else do we got here before i go sterling says thank you for saving my life you're welcome thank you for telling me that i saved your life because that's important i think people need to hear that more uh been, you know what maybe the next maybe next thursday we'll talk about suicide i know sometimes that's a tough I, I gosh i'm starting out with these really really depressing topics maybe we'll talk about that a little bit uh been through the family courts here in reno oh cool i'm in reno too man uh, look me up sometime or, or, um, hit me up on, on, uh, excuse me, hit me up on Twitter and I'm Rolla Tomasi at rational mail. Uh, let's see. LOL living out loud says I bought your first book from Amazon today. I'm looking forward to reading it. I'm going to give you a good review. Thank you. That was the next thing I was going to say is if you don't have any money, if you're a poor starving artist or a high school kid and you can't afford anything the best thing you can do is to give me a good review on amazon i am currently fighting a um a review spamming campaign by certain people who will go nameless but just use your imagination you'll probably be right uh and so any good reviews for any of the books by the way um is always helpful. So please help me out with that. Um, I would love it if you would give me a five-star review, but whatever you feel. Um, and then finally, tomorrow, I will be on the Pat Campbell show at 905 Eastern. Uh, that is in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Follow my, or you can find the link to that um, on my website, which is on the sidebar of my blog, which is therationalmail.com. 
and uh, or you can just simply follow me on Twitter and you'll get the announcement uh, before I go on. But it'll be 905 Eastern. That is tomorrow um, or 605 Pacific, which is what I have to deal with. So I get up pretty early to do that show. So I really appreciate all the ears. <laughs> if you want to listen to it live, you can also get the archives of it, too. Um, and then Rule Zero is going to be on or excuse me, it's going to be on uh, Rich's channel, Rich Cooper's channel, which is Entrepreneurs and Cars. We are going to talk about MGTOW this this week. So, um, yeah, we're, we've, we've talked about MGTOW before. People think that we're, we're trying to sensationalize something or we're just doing this for clicks or something like that. It's like, no, I mean, we pass the show around, okay? Nobody is, nobody is trying to get more or less clicks for, you know, for, for their thing. If anything, we, if we were trying to get the most clicks, we would not put it on, on Rich's channel. We would put it on John's because John doesn't have that big of a channel. Um, however, uh, that's not our intent. We've done, uh, when I was on uh, the Red Man Group, we have done episodes on Big Tau, at least two that I can think of. So it's not just for sensationalizing. We really want to have a conversation and really have a, a really good, strong discourse about this. So I will be on, that will be at 1130 a.m. Eastern Time on Saturday, and that will be on Entrepreneurs and Cars, which is Rich Cooper's channel. If you're not getting the um, the alerts, go subscribe to him, subscribe to me. If you haven't subscribed to this channel, please do. Tell your friends. Also, the best way to support this actual show is to copy and paste the URL right up here and uh, put it in a tweet, uh, put it on a Facebook post, put it on your blog, put it wherever if you really liked it. And uh, that's the best way to do it because uh, YouTube's not certainly not going to rank me and uh, Google will have to rank me if you do that. So uh, thank you guys very much. It is now 5.01 on the east, or excuse me, on the west coast. That means it's 8 o'clock over there, and I have to go call Pat Campbell about tomorrow's show. So I hope you guys enjoyed this. We'll be doing this again. If you have suggestions for the show, for the next show, uh, topics, always put them in the comments. I would very much like to hear what you guys would like me to speak on. Uh, otherwise, I'm just sort of flying by the seat of my pants. I really want to do a show on... Uh, uh, dispelling the myths about hypergamy or the misconceptions, the deliberate misconceptions of hypergamy. So that will be definitely be an upcoming show. I don't know if it'll be next one, but it will definitely be something coming up. I really want to talk about that. So, um, but if you have ideas, please put them in the comments down here and let me know. Okay. Thank you guys. I very much appreciate your attention. See you next week.